uh, improving the healthcare sector in a given area, improving access to a, um, a certain resource uh, such as animal health services. Uh, doing that requires working through partners, private sector partners, government, uh, and doing so sustainably requires them to change their behavior. Uh, and, and that means there's a lack of control from the program side. Who knows what the incentives are for others to behave differently, for other businesses to operate differently, uh, for government policy, uh, so and, and cultural elements as well, of course. So the reason that, that adaptive management is important is that because we can't know all of that ahead of time, we okay. must act in order to learn what works. And when, when, that's, when that happens, you inherently do not know whether your intervention is going to be successful right off the bat or not. As part of the focus on adaptive management, the Beam Exchange has commissioned uh, both a, a study that was released uh, last year, as well as a series of blog posts earlier this year. So feel free to check them out on the Beam website. Uh, we'll put the link down in the chat box for you. Um, but the study kind of is a bit more comprehensive. It covers a few different elements that are necessary for taking such an experimental approach to development. This webinar will be focusing on one aspect of that, and that's come out through conversations with practitioners, through the blog posts that were posted. Um, and, and one of the issues that has come up is what we'll be talking about today, which is enabling the recruitment of team managers that can, that can build teams that adapt. Um, so again, this is not focusing on adaptive management writ large, but specifically how to recruit and, and support managers to do that effectively. So we will be having three presenters today, uh, and we're lucky to have a, a diversity of them. Um, each will, will present for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll take 25 minutes for Q&A. So we look forward to a rich discussion. Your questions, uh, again, can go in the chat box in your bottom right corner. Uh, and we'll be uh, moderating it at the back end. So things that are asked more frequently and themes that come up, uh, I'll pose the questions to the presenters uh, at the end. So first off, we'll have David, uh, David Ratliff. Uh, he is a self-proclaimed collaborating, learning, and adapting guru and master of the CLA universe. Um, <laughs> David also makes up his own job titles, clearly, uh, as a USAID Foreign Service Officer. Currently serving in Washington, he's going to be heading to Azerbaijan this summer. David will be talking about some of the structural elements that enable uh, or, or inhibit hiring adaptive managers, including tender requirements. Allison is Mercy Corps Markets and Learning Advisor. She guides agency efforts to support adaptive management and advises on market systems interventions. This has included leading research for Mercy Corps' ADAPT partnership with the IRC. Allison will be talking uh, about some of the organizational changes that Mercy Corps is working on to support adaptive management in their organization. Finally, we'll have Matthias Herr. Matt is the co-team co leader of the Eastern European Unit of Helvetas, Swiss Intercooperation, and Senior Advisor for Market Systems Development. In this function, he manages and advises a portfolio of employment and income-related projects. Matt will be finishing us off uh, by sharing his experience as a manager of managers and talking about the recruitment and interview process, as well as support that he um, need, needs to provide to his staff. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic off to David. Uh, and David, take All right, so sorry about that. There are some technical issues. We're going to start off with Allison, and hopefully we can get David on the line afterwards. Thanks, Amir. Um, 
So yeah, uh, as Amir said in his introduction, I'm going to focus a little bit on some of Mercy Corps' agency-level efforts that we've been focusing on in order to really build adaptive teams internally and think about how we do that as an organization. Um, so I'm, well, while we're doing that a little bit out of order in terms of timing, the, the idea is that, you know, what, what happens in between the level of how we think about leaders within programs and how we think about them at the, at the donor level. So, so thinking, taking that sort of agency level angle. Um, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed that I'm the one here presenting on this because everything that I'm about to say actually builds so strongly on the efforts um, of so many of my team members um, and, and so much of their, their great thinking and their hard work in the field and at HQ to be pushing this forward. Um, so I, I, uh, I feel, you know, I, I feel almost as though we need eight different presenters up here to really share a lot of the wisdom. Um, so unfortunately, you guys are stuck just with me. Um, <laughs> so in order to sort of really represent, you know, I mentioned the fact that we've got so many team members that have contributed to this effort. This slide here is just to try and give you guys a snapshot of what it means to try and invest in having adaptive teams at an agency like Mercy Corps. We're, just to give you an example, if you're not familiar with Mercy Corps, we're nearly 5,000 strong in terms of membership. Um, we have a heavy focus on MSD programs um, in terms of our technical approach, but that is not the only thing we do by any means. We've, we've got all sorts of technical sectors. We're involved in both more humanitarian and development work. Um, and you know, this picture just gives you an idea of what that journey has looked like. It actually, to point out the, the importance of MSD to us as, a, as an agency that really focuses on taking a systems-based approach, the efforts to really push adaptive management into our teams to recruit and retain people who can, can be adaptive managers has, has been a journey. Um, in fact, Amir, our facilitator, started um, in many ways, a piece of this journey, working on a case study on what adaptive management looks like and what that leadership looks like in a case of an MSD program in Uganda. And then we actually realized that we had a grant groundswell, and there was a lot of interest in this and a lot of, a lot of um, engagement actually at the field level, people who wanted to speak up, share resources, um, and, and learn about the ways and the tips and the tricks that they could be using to do this more. So we created a framework for that within Mercy Corps. We put that out there. And again, lots of interest, both internally and externally, to be honest. So then we invested, actually, in a set of case studies to really learn a little bit more about what were the factors that were most enabling or inhibiting our, our, our teams from being adaptive. And we did that in partnership with IRC. So that was the ADAPT partnership. And then where we've landed now is figuring out how we can reinsert that back into our agency. How do we infuse that learning back into our programs at large? And also for me, sitting as, as an advisor that supports our MSD program um, and my team, how can we make sure that we're, we're reinforcing that back into our MSD approach as well? So just to give you um, uh, a quick overview of what came out of that ADAPT research with IRC that I just mentioned. Um, there, were, there were five key themes that emerged. I'm going to just do a quick run through. Um, first and foremost, as you might imagine, having dynamic teams. I'll get more into that in a second. Appropriate analysis, thinking about m and &E, but also thinking much more broadly about learning, making sure that that gets plugged into responsive decision making. Uh, then also integrating agile operations into our, our programming. And then making sure that we have flexible funding and trusted relationships. And that gets a lot at, at, at donors and, and funding. Um, but, you know, really the, the point of all of this is to think about dynamic teams, right? What have we learned about dynamic teams? From our research, lots of interesting nuances emerge, but really we can focus on three things. Both in our MSD cases, we, we did one coming out of our Uganda RAIN program and other, and other programs as well. Uh, we recognize that hiring, hiring local and hiring for an adaptive mindset was really critical. Making sure that our teams could foster a culture of open communication. Um, and providing mentorship and coaching. Those, those things at a program level have been really critical um, for getting the right people on board, 
developing their skill sets and giving them the types of motivation and incentives they need to stick around. So what does that mean in terms of what we're doing at an agency level? That's all well and good, but how do we move this forward? So I'm going to talk about this at, at two levels. Uh, first at a program level um, and then at an agency level. So at a program level, if we're thinking about, about how are we pushing forward dynamic teams, there is, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I know that Matt's going to talk a lot more about some of those, those program pieces. But what we've focused on is actually a process um, that has been somewhat organic and somewhat intentional of figuring out how we can collect examples of how we are recruiting and retaining the right people uh, in our MSD programs, figuring out how to showcase those programs, and making sure that we share what we're, what we're learning back out to the field. Um, you know, we talk about our, our jobs as advisors and as we also work, you know, with our with our HR, what we refer to as our people team in Mercy Corps, multiple channels and is, is really critical. So doing that within our technical sector for MSD, but also making sure that we're connecting uh, more broadly with the agency. What that looks like specifically is the harder pieces, making sure that we're sharing things like org structures and position descriptions, um, but also a lot of the, the tips, thinking about the principle of in MSD, recruiting gradually and letting your team grow, uh, making sure that you can, as I mentioned before, figure out the right ty types of tips and tactics for hiring locally. Um, and then even getting down to the level of swapping interview tips internally. Um, so when we talk about how, we, how we're collecting examples, there's a few different ways that we've gone about this. One of them is by reaching out individually to, to targeted champions. And the other one is through having more broad mechanisms using our internal communication platform um, to, to sort of collect what we're learning about um, adaptive leadership. And, and one of the things that we've recently done um, is, is built this into um, one of the great efforts that one of my colleagues has been working on, which is our MSD resource guide. And so, you know, we, think, we often think about what we're going to do as an MSD program as the analysis um, how to design interventions, how to do facilitation, but we've also recognized that that resource guide needs to include how to build the team as well. Um, and so the, I think, you know, one of the principles that's been really critical about this resource guide is that we are as quickly as possible trying to, to gather and share out the resources from the field. If we're being our appropriate vectors, we need to have these things in a centralized place. Um, and I think a lesson learned for me, having just gone through this process, is that taking the time to invest in doing this stuff is so worthwhile. Um, you don't, it doesn't need to be perfect, it doesn't need to be complete, but just reaching out and saying, hey guys, what are your examples, pulling those in and then making those available when you're in the field is, is infinitely useful. Um, so that's, that's an internally available resource. Meanwhile, we also have broader platforms that we've been using. We're actually following in USAID's lead and doing an internal case competition. Um, so, you know, the, the next level that we can think about is what does that mean for an agency? So as I mentioned, um, Mercy Corps does MSD and they also do other types of programming as well. Um, and, and it's been really interesting to, to recognize that, that first of all, you know, this is, Beam is an MSD platform, um, but there's a lot of broader engagement and resources that exist outside of the MSD community as well. And that's definitely been true uh, within Mercy Corps. So as, we, as we've embarked on trying to sort of collate and, and bring together all of our resources, we realize that so much already exists. Um, I have the example of what we, is our Women Wanted case study. We have a great case study that our, um, that our, our gender team worked on. Um, and that's, that's actually really critical for figuring out how to integrate gender into MSD programs, for example. Um, I put in here, remember the basics. As much as we think about all of our, our big, great ideas, let's remember that we still struggle with, struggle with the basic things like making sure that handovers happen um, and that how important some, the, some of these basics are for effectiveness and retention. Um, I've put here also that we've, we've worked on collaborating across the technical team and with our, with our people team. So they've been working hard, our people team, that, um, and in collaboration with um, 
some of my colleagues with Emma Proud, working on revising our cornerstones of leadership, which are an agency level um, initiative, and focusing on improving our broad onboarding. So one of the things that I've realized is that the process of intentionally engaging and making sure that we're internally collaborating has actually been really valuable just for learning about what resources exist, not just at the field level, but within our agency, and making sure that we do a good job of making those available to this field. Um, and, you know, then it's important to remember that as much as we spend so much time focusing on platforms and communications and resources and guides, that we always have to be recognizing and championing adaptive leadership. And if we're not doing this, if we're not incentivizing it, if we're not making it cool, if we're not saying, hey guys, it's not just your technical approach, but it's the cool strategies and tactics you use to motivate your teams, then we won't be able to harvest the rich knowledge that our field programs have. So I have a couple of screenshots up here of some recent um, case studies that our teams have done in the program, in their programs to highlight what their, what are some of the, the behaviors and characteristics that they've done. You know, how, how is it that they're effectively using whiteboards? How is it that they encourage accountability? What are their platforms for sharing results on a daily, weekly basis? And those real live examples are the things that each program finds most useful from each other. Um, and we recognize that happens at a program level and again, at an agency level. We have people in operations, finance, HR, technical support, and we're all working to support the field. And each of our jobs um, is really important to driving effective leadership. So we, we've had to make sure that we come together and we champion, um, you know, not just the day-to-day the -day work, but recognizing that the day-to-day -day work is actually important and actually is what helps us deliver results. Of course, that means there's lots of challenges to tackle. Throw in a photo here of lots of post-it notes we have. Um, we put up on a board of all the agency efforts we've done. Um, a piece of that is figuring out how to connect with things like changes in policy guidance. Um, as USAID has made some changes recently, um, it's important to make sure that we make, that, make sure that gets grounded in the field. Also, it means figuring out how to further sync up our systems and processes. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it over now to, I'm not sure if we're going to Matt or to uh, David. We'll be going to David. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay now. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the problem that we're facing, um, some of the things we can do to solve it, and then how to solve it. Um, in order to do that, I'd like to use a little metaphor from a story that hopefully most of you know pretty well, and that is Star Wars. And the reason that I want to use Star Wars, other than the fact that it's, you know, way better than Star Trek, is the fact that it's, you know, a very appropriate metaphor to what we're talking about. Um, I really see uh, the Empire as kind of that, you know, traditional development forces out there. Um, it's kind of like this huge behemoth that just keep things, they want to keep things going the way they are. They don't like change. Um, and there's a few of us out there that are in the, what I call the Rebel Adaptive Alliance. Um, and I've, I spent a little bit of time with Allison, and I kind of look at her as a Obi-Wan Kenobi out there, one of the, the Jedis fighting against the, the forces of evil. Um, and even though I'm, you know, one of the, the panelists here and a presenter, I wouldn't classify myself as, as Yoda at all. I'm probably more like to one of those unnamed pilots that, constantly get shot down and almost stepped on by the uh, AT-AT walkers. So I don't have all the answers uh, for you. I don't claim to. Um, it, it's really about, you know, helping to establish these coalitions and figure out the, the answers together. So uh, the first thing you'll notice is that I, I don't have a picture of the Death Star up there. Um, there's copyright issues, and I actually heard that George Lucas was going to be on the webinar. So I decided that I would use a picture of Bangladesh traffic instead um, because it, it kind of shows the, the chaos of what we're dealing with and that, you know, uh, there's different people out there. They're all trying to do it their own way. We're trying to figure out how to, how to navigate through. Um, and it's, it's incredibly messy. So um, change is difficult. Um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy working against us. That's probably what, you know, the Death Star is. It's this giant behemoth of bureaucracy that, that goes around and tries to annihilate the rest of us that are, are working against it. 
Um, we don't really have an adaptive management manual, so so you know we're kind of you know disorganized at the moment. So one of the things we can do is is to really try and unite this Rebel Alliance around the message of adaptive management. And we think in terms of, of personnel. Um, you know, most of the people out there, uh, most of the traditional development folks are kind of, you know, predisposed towards the, the way that the empire does things. And they, they, you know, they really come into it with that traditional development mentality. Um, we, we tend to hire, you know, technical experts and not necessarily people that have the leadership skills or adaptive management skills that we're, we're really looking for. Um, uh, USAID in particular does a rather horrible job of capacity building. So we, we don't really build up the skills of the people once they're in the agency apart from, from kind of those technical skills. We, and we don't focus on soft skills at all. So, so we kind of just hope and pray that they become the leaders that, that we really want them to become. Um, we're not great at communicating what we want and what we really need. So, you know, if you look at procurement documents, if you look at internal hiring documents, they pretty much all look the same. Uh, it's usually like a bachelor's degree or a higher level degree. There'll be some requirements for experience. Then there'll be the technical skills that we want. Um, and very rarely do you see anything like, um, you know, demonstrated ability to work well under pressure or work well with others. Those kind of soft skills may be touched on rarely in those documents, but we don't, we also don't do a great job of actually confirming whether or not the, 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 the people applying for those positions actually have those soft skills that we're looking for. Um, you know, it's pretty much just on paper or it's not. Um, the other thing, you know, when, when USAID looks to implementing partners to hire staff, um, we don't spend a whole lot of time developing those requirements that go out either. Um, and, and usually they only care about it once it Hello everyone, it looks like we are having technical difficulties again. Um, just hold on with me for one moment. Can you guys, sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I think someone's out there trying to get me. Um, <laughs> yeah, the forces of evil are working against me. Um, so <laughs> let me move on to uh, what we should be doing instead. Um, All right, hopefully I won't be lost again. Um, so a lot of it's like the opposite of what I just talked about. Um, we need to better explain like how we actually do adaptive management so our you know rebel forces can actually go out there and do it and not just talk about it. Um, USAID's taken the first step on that with our new program cycle guidance and, and really trying to highlight the importance of adaptive management and uh, the principles of collaborating, learning, and adapting. But, uh, but now we really need to create an action plan of how to do it. Um, in terms of personnel, uh, we really need to start hiring based on qualities and less so on uh, technical experience and, and just years of experience. So we need people that, you know, really understand what collaborating, learning, and adapting is. 
um, and can apply it in a way that's systematic, intentional, and resourced. Uh, we need our leaders to be facilitators, not generals. We need them to listen and be able to communicate effectively. Uh, we need people that are humble, um, people that are comfortable with and, and open to change, that don't blame individuals if, if things don't go according to plan. Um, a, a huge thing for me is, is uh, leaders that are curious, that, that really want to learn, um, ones that are transparent, um, ones that can lead even in the midst of all the ambiguity which we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, leaders that have problem-solving skills. And most importantly, I feel we need action-oriented decision-makers, so ones that you know, really practice what they preach. Um, we also need to do a much better job of training our staff once we get them in the organization. And I would say, you know, especially on that soft skills side, there's not many training courses out there that, that teach you how to um, talk to David, looks like we've lost you again. All right, what we're going to do here um, is we'll move on to Matthias. I'm really sorry to do this. And perhaps, David, we can get you back more reliably for the Q&A. Um, yep, very awkward, but we're going to do that. Sorry, folks. Yeah, hi everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and thank you also to Amir for inviting me to this uh, webinar as presenter and also thanks to Beam Exchange for organizing this webinar. Um, I've been asked to tell a bit from the implementer's point of view as to how we deal with uh, recruitment and retainment of project managers in regard to adaptive management. So. What I'll be talking about within the next 10 minutes uh, are basically three things. First of all, I want to clarify a bit uh, what it is about for us. Why, why is the topic relevant? Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the how. Uh, we are on a learning path ourselves, but I'm happy to share some of the insights uh, from our experience so far. And uh, thirdly, uh, wrap up with a few key questions uh, that, that emerge from, from that. Um, maybe I'll start with a little bit of a background, uh, perhaps. Um, Helvetus has made some good progress over the last year in implementing an inclusive systems approach, as, as we call it in our organization, uh, within our projects around the world. Particularly within the portfolio in Eastern Europe that I manage, we have been making a big push for this in the last five years. Uh, while we apply the principles and frameworks of the MSD approach as outlined in the operational guide that you can also download from Beam Exchange platform, we're also trying to form our own brand of it that suits also our organizational vision and culture. Uh, in doing so, we're applying a systems approach increasingly also to other thematic areas uh, that are non-private sector development specific, such as governance, uh, education, water infrastructure, environment, and, and climate change. Um, now, the reality of, of our work is that development is a very complex matter. Um, I think David already sort of mentioned that in his presentation. Um, and, and a systemic approach does not necessarily make it easier for us. On the contrary, it's not about, uh, it's not anymore about providing charity to our target beneficiaries, but it is about how the performance of, of relevant systems around them, whether these are economic sub, uh, subsector systems, uh, education systems, infrastructure systems, etc., how these systems impact the lives of, of our target groups, and, and how these can be changed in ways that, that is sustainable and benefits not only a few, but, but many now and, and, and also in the future. This, again, requires an understanding of, of the complexity of systems that we're dealing with and, and how we can influence them in becoming more inclusive for disadvantaged groups. 
it requires an understanding that uh, realities uh, of systems change all the time and that we cannot know everything up front and that our strategies to imp influence them need to be based on continuous learning and adaptation. That's why we need adaptive management and that's also why we need managers that can adapt. Um, I want to continue on the superhero theme that David introduced. Um, and I think it was Jim Tamburn, actually, who I'm very happy to see also amongst the participants saying at the Beam Exchange Conference in Lusaka last year that this um, idea of complexity and the demands that it poses towards the people in, in projects has led both donors and implementers to look uh, for, for superheroes. The requirements towards successful and adaptive management are so high that it's virtually impossible to meet them all. The market for project managers therefore tends to be very thin and, and, and also closed. In a working group organized by Lucio Osario from, from Beam Exchange, uh, we discussed last year the challenge of building capacity in the market for MSD managers and staff. In other words, it's really tough to find good managers for us and then to retain them. So, coming to the how, I would like to talk about our experience in regard to three questions. First of all, what are we looking for? So, this concerns the recruitment criteria. Secondly, how do we find the right people? This concerns the process of, of doing so. And thirdly, what do we do to keep good managers? This is the retainment. As said before, we are on, only on a learning path ourselves here, uh, so we do not have the answers to these questions, but we would rather like to share some insights of, of the learning path that we're on right now. In the last half year, I, I had a, a couple of recruitments of project managers. There were some changes as projects transitioned from one phase to another, uh, and people were moving on. One project manager retired, another is now managing a Helvetus project in Asia. Uh, the participant knows who am I talking about. Um, and in a third case, our donor has increased the scope of the project significantly, and we therefore need to adapt the project management structure of that project. This illustrates also a point on retainment that I would like to come to in a bit. Life cycles of projects are, are short. People are moving from one assignment to the next, often in two to four year cycles. So that's, so what, what is the organization's strategy actually to uh, not only retain these people, but retain their knowledge and experience within the organization? Coming to the selection criteria first. In our experience, uh, uh, and, and it's also come through quite a bit through, through David's uh, uh, presentation when he was talking about the soft skills. Uh, there are must-have criteria and, and nice-to-have criteria. Um, first to the must-have criteria. Uh, most importantly for us is, is a good understanding of the systemic approach and, and its implications. Uh, here we also notice that there are different understandings of what MSD, M4P, uh, or a systems approach is uh, that are floating around. So we need to test whether the candidates have the same understanding as we do uh, within Helvetus uh, during an interview process. In terms of management experience, it is important that project managers have already been in some leadership role before. Uh, that means they are able to deal with the complexities of, of political economies around the project, uh, motivate staff, management, uh, manage relationships to partners. Uh, some specific skills, such as financial management, are also good, of course, uh, but can also be trained, as the administrative systems are often very organization-specific. For Adaptive management, I believe that soft skills are more important than the technical and sector-specific skills. Project managers need to uh, demonstrate the ability to analyze, to learn, and to adapt. They need to be able to understand the bigger picture and guide the team and partners accordingly. 
They need to be really good communicators and networkers in order to understand change processes and identify opportunities as entry points. What is important for us, however, is that the people we recruit also share, to some extent, our organizational values. Helvetus is not just a contracting agency, but has its own vision as an NGO and ambition to add value to projects through own expertise and experience. Coming to the nice-to-haves, I often find that in the recruitment of project managers, we tend to give too much weight to the wrong criteria. For example, the number of years of experience, sector-specific knowledge, or regional exposure. This creates entry barriers for others, keeps the market of experienced project managers thin, and prevents innovative and more dynamic solutions for project management, especially in regard to the question of adaptive project management. The most experienced managers are not always the most adaptive ones. The managers with lots of regional exposure are not always those that bring in interesting new ideas. So it's important that before we recruit, we are clear on how much weight we want to give these criteria. I learned du uh, during our recruitments that it's necessary and important to agree with your donor and consortium partners on these criteria. It is, if necessary, this also requires a dialogue about adaptive management and what kinds of people it takes to do so. The process of hiring good managers underlies many challenges, and I want to perhaps name only three here. I'm, I'm sure there are lots more to add. First of all, projects underlie a complex political economy in which the expectations of donors and partners need to be managed and aligned very carefully. I therefore learned that consultation and involvement of donors and partners in the process of recruitment is critical in order to avoid uh, misperceptions or miscommunications towards the end. When, the, when, for example, the donor then finally has to approve the person that the implementer proposes, and then the realization is there that it does not meet the donor's expectations if no consultation process has taken place. We have, for example, made good experiences with SDC here, uh, where they were involved at important steps uh, during the process, and uh, including also within a final selection panel. Secondly, a transparent recruitment process is important, not only in being accountable to our client, but also in being fair to the candidates and making sure we really consider different options. However, we should not only rely on open calls for applications and formal recruitment process, but it processes, but it requires a combination with headhunting and, and direct interaction with potential candidates. It's a combination of fishing in a pond versus hunting for what you know you want. Therefore, also planning with a bit more time for recruitment is good. In order to find out whether the candidates really bring the type of skills that we have been talking about earlier, the recruitment process needs to consist of several steps and, and, and a mix of different tools and tests. It also requires quite some investment in terms of money, for example, when we fly candidates in for a second round of interviews, assessment centers, and all the logistics around that. In order to identify those adaptive management skills, we have, for example, started to introduce group work exercises where the candidate is given a strategic exercise related to a project intervention and then works with members of his or her future team on reviewing and refining that intervention. The selection panel then observes, observes and dis discusses with the candidate afterwards. Uh, so it's, it's really that, that mix of tools that's also important to, to look at. I also found that the combination of professional support in recruitment from our HR department with the more technical operational uh, view has worked very, really very well. In our case, HR people were uh, open and flexible enough to allow modifications in the process, uh, and I believe that too rigid recruitment processes are really not helpful. You already need to be adaptive in the process if you want to uh, 
uh, have adaptive project managers coming out at the end of that process. Now, we recruited a great project manager with adaptive management skills. How do we keep him or her? It is important to understand that adaptive management does not only rely on the project manager, him or herself, but also relies on the organizational framework within which he or she is embedded. This was one of the questions that actually uh, one of the participants was asking about uh, up front before the webinar. Uh, good project managers will only apply to those projects where they feel they have the freedom to develop interesting stuff and where they get the support also in, in doing so. And there are three aspects in this. First of all, it's important to realize as an implementing agency that the project management position is the most important one that you have in your organization. It concerns our core business. Organizational structures, therefore, need to be built around this notion in order to achieve successful projects. Secondly, within the implementing agency, there are several factors that determine whether or not you provide a conducive environment for adaptive uh, management and, and, and also the job satisfaction of, of uh, project managers. Good backstopping support, for example, is critical at different levels. Project managers need, need a continuous uh, sounding board for strategic steering. So the kind of bigger picture type of management to see whether a project overall is, is on track. They require specific and short-term technical inputs, such as on MRM or, or gender and social inclusion and, and other topics. They need management and administrative support. Also, a good learning culture exchange between projects uh, and also within, within, with the wider development community is important. Project managers also need perspectives. What else can you offer to managers after three to four years within your organization? How do you retain their knowledge? Implementers need a view beyond individual project mandates. They need to have a long-term organizational strategy, particularly in regard to human resources. And being a bit self-critical here, I think all too often implementers uh, point the finger at donors here rather than looking at what are their own longer-term human resource strategies. In terms of processes, it's important that they don't create a regulatory environment that restricts adaptive management. To give you an example, right now we are discuss discussing a revision of our procurement rules. How do you effectively balance the need for accountability and anti-corruption measures on the one side with the need to manage adaptively? This is a very critical question with, with regard to procurement rules. And of course, the pay and benefit package finally needs to be attractive as well. Uh, looking at the donor side in terms of retainment, um, in order to, for managers to feel supported in, their, uh, in managing their prospe uh, projects adaptively and using a systemic approach, it is important that donors and implementers share a common vision, an understanding of their approach and its implications, particularly in maintaining a certain degree of flexibility and openness. It needs to be clear that while broader strategic pillars are predefined, the tactics might actually take different and often unexpected routes. In this regard, we have made very good experience in trying to maintain an active exchange and partnership with our donors. We actually want them to be more involved and, and understand what the projects are doing and why. This then creates a spirit of partnership that allows also changes and adaptive management. Then. So in order to retain managers for adaptive management, the key question here is, how much freedom can you give managers and their teams while ensuring sufficient support and, of course, also accountability. And to conclude with a few key questions that may trigger further discussion in your, your own organizations or within this round. First of all, do we, do we actually have a shared understanding with our donors? What implementers want is not always what donors are ready to give. 
Secondly, do we know what we need and how realistic our expectations are? Are we looking for superheroes or, or are we actually able to compromise that image of adaptive project managers? Are we open to alternative and new management models which perhaps also allow the thin market for skill, skilled project managers to become a bit richer in choice? In what way are our recruitment process conducive for finding the right people? Is the process sufficiently adaptive to allow identification of adaptive managers? And my last two questions relate to the organizational culture and setup. How much are we how much are we willing and able to invest into people? Do we as implementers have a long-term HR strategy or do we only rely on donors here to help us retain skilled people? And finally, are we sufficiently set up for adaptive management? Do our systems and processes allow flexibility? And with that, I would end and, and thank, hand back to Amir again. Thank you, Matt. That was a, a rich set of questions to end with. I feel like my, my brain is swimming a little bit. Um, all right. Thank you all for, for asking the questions that you are. Please continue to send your questions along in the chat box. Um, and I will be posing the first question to David, uh, who I believe we have back. David, confirm that your mic's working? I am here. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Excellent. Yeah, Darth Vader struck me down. I've, I've returned. Um, so the first question comes from Mike Klassen. And uh, again, David, you can start us off. And Matt and Allison, if you'd like to jump in, feel free to do so. Um, the question is, what are some thoughts on the pipelines that either currently do produce or create good budding managers or that could do a better job in the future? Are there examples of master's programs worldwide that have a good reputation for teaching the next generation about systems change and the soft skills mentioned throughout? Or are any, are any master's programs too removed and irrelevant? And so the main source is always going to be past experience and those soft skills. David. Yeah, so uh, I guess being like a curriculum development specialist myself, uh, we have a principle that's called uh, 10 20 70. I don't know if anyone's heard of it out there, but uh, literally like you get 10% of your knowledge through classroom training. Uh, you get about 20% from colleagues and the other 70% comes from on the job experience. Um, so I would actually push for more, you know, more junior level opportunities of shadowing and being able to be mentored by those adaptive leaders that we that we know are out there, um, and and there there are a lot of a lot of great ones. I, I think we could do a better job of you know coming up with some kind of a database out there that's shared between donors and implementers, so we don't keep passing the same bad eggs from you know one contract to another, um, and that would really help us be able to have time to put some of these junior people. Uh, with them as, as really a learning experience, um, but we have to we have to make the decision that we we actually want to invest in that and and that we can invest with that and the, and the donors would have to agree with that as well that that you know we're we're not you know it's not just a, a key personnel decision but that we're going to allow some of the resources to be uh, put towards grooming that that next generation of leaders. So thanks. Hopefully that answered it. Um, yeah, if I may. Add, yeah, okay. Uh, if if I may add to that, um, I, I think exactly this question has been the subject to sort of a group work that uh, Lucio uh, formed uh, late late last year, and and we had a meeting on that in London. Uh, it was about capacity development uh, or the market for capacity development in the field of MSD and and adaptive management. And I think what what the sort of common conclusion was amongst the participants there is that we're not doing enough yet to to actually uh, nurture the next generation of adaptive management managers basically and and MSD um, skilled staff. Um, so 
and, and I think the the common conclusion was also that it's not sufficiently to uh, sufficient to have one off trainings, but that it required a combination of, of different tools that, that we need to also look more at coaching and backstopping uh, type of support for for staff um, and and that of course requires a, a degree of willing uh, capacity in the first place to do that um, within an implementing agency, for example, but also investment, uh, uh, money actually allocated towards training and, and, and coaching. Um, and, and my feeling, as I mentioned also in my presentation, was that too much is sort of um, implementers too easily point at donors here, but I think as implementers we, we also need to seriously ask ourselves um, about what our strategies are in this, this regard. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's more difficult if, if you define yourself as a pure contracting agency uh, versus an agency that perhaps has the ambition to, to contribute with sort of own expertise and experience. So, so I think what we're trying to do also in, in, in our projects and what we're trying also to convince our donors uh, for is to invest more into the backstopping type of support. So this is really ongoing support at strategic, at technical and, and management administrative level. And, and this is sometimes where, where it becomes difficult when, when, for example, head office parts in the budget uh, do not look great if there's a lot of backstopping support coming into projects. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'll David, I think. Yeah. <laughs> David, I think you know. I was thinking the same thing as you. We always try and hire for the mindset. We don't expect that people are necessarily going to have the skills that they would need. Um, but in recruitment strategies, doing things like taking people into a market, giving them a case study, thinking a little bit outside the box, I think that's really critical. Um, and then we also focus on doing things like TDYs or exchange visits. Um, and focusing on sort of active mechanisms that we can reinforce at an agency level um, to, to sort of help bring up the next generation of market facilitation leaders. Great. I'll, um, I'll move on to the next question, which is related. Uh, actually, in this one, Allison, you can start us off. Um, and this comes from one of the questions submitted ahead of time by the participants. Uh, the question is, is there experience in applying competency frameworks in the development of individuals, teams, and managers engaged with M4P programs? And I'm going to guess this specifically with related to adaptive management, so like specific competency frameworks that you might be adopting at, a, at an organizational level. That the, the competency framework that we typically still use is the one actually that Engineers Without Borders um, developed and I think has been circulated through a lot of different programs. We still use that at our core for um, what we are thinking of specifically for MSD programs. But when we think about this at an agency level, we also have, I mentioned that we've been revising our cornerstones of leadership. Um, so there's a lot of this stuff that we have to recognize isn't just MSD. Um, so within those cornerstones of leadership, we focus on having those adaptive mindsets and skills um, as a part of that revision, and that's something that's agency-wide. Um, so it's a it's a dual level thing. You know, we we're just building on the the good framework that we already have within MSD. Let's not overthink this. Um, but then we've also you know taken on that broader agency effort of of actually looking at um, how we can do that more broadly um, and. That, that Mercy Corps framework then can map something that's more specific for MSD. All right. Um, and now a question for Matt. Again, coming from questions submitted ahead of time. How do we support adaptive managers to manage the potential conflicts between his or her sense of job security and the potential professional risks they may have to take in their roles? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if you manage adaptive, adaptively, you, it, it's in the nature of adaptive management to, to take risks. Um, and I think it's important in that case for the project manager then to, to know that 
he can take those risks, uh, though those risks need to be uh, calculated risks. Uh, we need to minimize these risks, but he needs to know that uh, uh, there is an organizational culture uh, also that allows uh, failure, um, that, that then also learns from failure, uh, and that if failure happens, that um, his his supervisor sitting somewhere in the head office or or uh, or in the country office uh, would not uh, rate that as as negative, uh, but rather try and draw lessons from. So I, I think to some extent it's a cultural question within in your organization in in how far the organization allows risks to happen, and I think that that relates very much to applying a systems approach or versus a charity approach where you, you can plan probably things a bit more rigorously up front and, and there's less less risk. Um, so, and, and then secondly, uh, next to the cultural question, secondly, again, it, it brings me back to the, the backstopping question. Um, I, I think a project manager needs to have the feeling that he's not standing alone there with, with his decisions, but that he he has a sounding board uh, with someone perhaps a little bit more outside of the project with whom he can discuss strategic questions, with whom he can discuss uh, risk-taking measures, that he has technical experts available that help him to analyze, understand uh, risks and, and, and mitigate these risks. Uh, so, so good backstopping support is, is also critical and, and, and investment therein as well. So I think these are the two main points that I would uh, answer to that. Yeah. David or Allison? Um, maybe just from a donor perspective, we, we talk about risk a lot and we say that we want people to take risks, but the actions I've seen of a lot of staff don't necessarily support that. So al although we say we want people to take risks, if, if those risks don't work out and there's failure, a, a lot of times the, the donors do come back uh, negatively. So I would say that there's, there's a degree of trust that has to be built between the implementer and the donor um, in order to support more risk taking. Um, and it's, I guess it's easier said than done. We, we think about trust as a given. We, you know, it's, it's like a word, but the actual action behind that word to, to build the trust, it takes, it takes time. And so I, I think we just need to have that um, understood in advance and um, spend some time building those relationships in order to, um, to get to, to more risk-taking and innovation. And I agree with you, David, that, you know, it's, it is, I do think that relationship building is a, is a big part of that. Um, I think accountability is also a big part of it, too. Uh, recognizing that actually creating some clear structures around accountability gives people also the, the, the freedom or the flexibility or the comfort to take more risks. Um, so, it, you know, even if you are holding your teams accountable for, you know, knowing that they just need to deliver on X, Y, Z simple indicators, um, and that they're, that allows them some additional experimentation, that that's really valuable. That relationship building with the donor, I think, is, is really critical. Um, saying it's not just about failure, but it's about what we will learn and do differently. So, I guess taking that next step is really critical, and, and then making sure that you've just got some simple structures in we, we've had projects that have, have really been able to experiment and do a lot of really interesting things. And sometimes the reason that they've done that is because they've actually had very clear basic accountability structures um, with their donors and their indicators were, were sort of clearly defined. So it felt like risk was taken care of and allowed for a lot of other interesting, um, more innovative things to happen. Interesting. Thank you, Allison. Um, so we are uh, kind of coming to the end of on this uh, webinar. So before we before we wrap up, I'd like to hear from each of you. Um, I notice we have a number of individuals from the HR and kind of people side of organizations, which is fantastic. I think that's it's really need to have them as part of the discussion. So a special welcome and thank you to you. Um, and then addressing the kind of HR system topic, if 
each of you, David, Allison, and Matt, were to give one to two very specific pieces of advice to, say, an HR manager in an implementing organization or a contracts manager in a donor organization with regards to changing HR practices to better enable adaptive management, um, what would that piece of advice be? Uh, we'll start with Matt and then David Allison. Yeah, I think I said it already in my presentation. Um, if you want adaptive managers, be adaptive in your recruitment process. I think that would be all to say. <laughs> Sorry, uh, oh, Matt, I didn't know he was done. Okay, um, so I guess my message for implementers would be, um, you know, even though we don't always, we're not always clear about what we want, we do want adaptive managers. We do want implementers to 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 be adaptable. Um, and and if you have somebody that doesn't specifically meet the sometimes ridiculous requirements that we lay out in our procurement documents, um, make a good argument. Um, you know, I've been on those tech panels and I've seen non-traditional candidates and, you know, the implementer makes a good case. We, you know, we, we go for it. So don't be afraid to, to put somebody forward that may not fit that traditional mold. Um, you know, we can't, we can't be innovative unless uh, we have the people, and it's all about the people. We've, I've seen really good designs be destroyed by bad people, and I've seen really bad designs, uh, you know, become really successful because of, of, of good people. So, so really, to me, it, it is all about the people, and um, we, we really need your support to make that happen. And I, I, I'd love to sit down with um, Matthias to, to talk more about some of the, the hiring practices that they do and see if we can get um, more of our partners out there to do the same thing. So thanks. Let's do that. Um, I agree, I'd agree about keeping the process adaptive. Uh, I think one thing that our people team does is, you know, they, they can create the space um, to do, to try innovative different types of interviewing techniques. We have our standard processes, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't allow for other things. Um, so within that, you know, really just sit down with your technical people and find out what it is that they're looking for and where it is that they want to recruit from. Make a plan together. I think that's point one. And then point two is keep doing what you're doing um, because onboarding, retention, um, and, and um, figuring out how to transition people between roles, just the nuts and bolts, we, we still need so much emphasis on that. Um, and I have a lot of respect for our people team and the work that they're, being, they're doing on, on the nuts and bolts and trying to be innovative at the same time. All right. Um, so we are, we're running about six minutes over. Uh, so I'm going to cap the official webinar there. Uh, thank you so much to the kind of 40 plus participants uh, and special thanks David, Allison, Matt for joining us today. Uh, again, the recording of this webinar will be available uh, online. The email, the, the link will be emailed out to all of you. And if you have further questions, please don't stop the discussion here. Start a thread on the BEAM LinkedIn website or on MAFI, the Market Facilitation Initiative. Um, have conversations within your organization. Uh, and with others, or reach out directly, myself, Sarah, Ashley, David, Allison, Matt, like feel free to, to ask questions because really the, the richness of, of, what, of the, what the topics discussed in this webinar are what happens within the organizations um, and the implementing agencies that are, that are represented here. So again, thank you and have a great rest of the day or evening, depending on where you are.